Welcome to episode number five of the Big Time Strength Podcast. Uh, really excited today. Uh, we're kicking off a new season. You know, Preston and I have had a couple episodes here in the last few weeks. Uh, but before that, we kind of took a little bit of a break over the summer. Um, and, we're, and we're back in it now. And, and we're starting out season three, which, um, you know, it seems like yesterday, Preston and I just kind of started this thing. So it's, it's crazy. We're on episode 95 right now. And we, we really appreciate um, all of our all of our listeners and all the feedback we get is fantastic. And uh, we're going to get through our sponsors. We actually have a new sponsor today. Then after that, we have a new exciting uh, development on our podcast that we're going to introduce today. So um, really excited about that. But first, let's get through um, and highlight our, our awesome sponsors who've been with us um, the first two for a while. And we've got a brand new one here to kick off the season three as well. So Team Builder, they are the leading software for high schools and colleges by providing coaches ability to write programs online, generate over 13 reports, and even train athletes remotely. If you sign up with code BIGTIME, you will receive a free APRE programming template, which works automatically within Team Builder. No more spreadsheets and workout cards to track training maxes that change day by day. Automate your programming without outsourcing your program programming with Team Builder. Um, you know, I say it every time. I really appreciate Hewitt and, and his crew. They do a fantastic job. Uh, they've really gotten us through uh, this COVID period and um, and the options they have, they just updated their strength conditioning feature, which is just awesome. Um, so if, if you're into that market, check them out. They do a great job. We really uh, appreciate their support. Our second sponsor is Powerlift. They are the leading manufacturer and distributor of heavy duty strength training equipment for collegiate and high school athletic performance centers around the world. They bring over 20 years of experience to the strength conditioning world. All products are manufactured in their state of the art facility in Jefferson, Iowa. They are proud to support all coaches making the big time where they are at. Uh, Mike Richardson and his crew, um, they also do obviously a fantastic job. They are a staple in the strength conditioning industry. And for them to be um, supporting us is, is huge. Uh, the last sponsor we have today, it's a new one, um, is Evan Sports Performance and their progressive speed system. Um, so if you're a strength conditioning coach who struggles in the area of speed development, or if you wish you had a system to teach acceleration, multi-directional speed, like the system you use in the weight room, um, or maybe do you know a lot of speed and agility drills, but don't really know what the drills are supposed to be teaching your athletes. If you would like a system that allows you to plug in your favorite drills in a progressive way to allow you to slowly prepare athletes to move better on the field or court, head over to evansportsperformance.com and type in BTS50 for $50 off of uh, Coach Evans' progressive speed system. I know that's something that uh, Preston and I have talked quite a bit about. We both like systems. Um, and it, it's really easy to have a system within the weight room, but you put them on the field, that field work, uh, it's, it, there's a lot more going on there. And Coach has put uh, together a really cool system um, that came on as a sponsor. And if you sign up with that code, you get $50 off. And all the information's on um, the show notes as well. So with that being said, again, thank you to all of our sponsors. Um, let's get into today's show. So the big ticket item on today's show is we're adding something new um, to the Big Time String podcast moving forward here. And that is the addition of a, a third host. And one of the kind of, I guess, goals of the Big Time Strength podcast, obviously, is to you know, talk about coaches that are making it big time where they're at in a small school setting and to highlight coaches who maybe don't get, um, I don't know, the platform to really to speak, um, to have their voices heard, talk about their programming uh, and their program and all the stuff they're doing. And I think we've done a great job with that. You know, and another part of that field that kind of gets um, the attention doesn't deserve or doesn't get the attention deserve, excuse me, is our female strength coaches. And we've asked, actually Amanda reached out and I'm going to let her take the, stage here real quick is Amanda Berg. She is, was on episode number 73 of the Big Time String Podcast. So if you really want to dive into her stuff, go check that out. Um, she's coming on as a host and she's going to highlight our female strength conditioning coaches. And we are super pumped about it. Um, really excited about this new direction of our podcast. So we'll have our myself doing the colleges, Preston sticking with the high school and, and Coach Berg um, highlighting our females, both at the high school and collegiate level. So with that, I'm going to hand this over to Coach Berg and let her take this away. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you, Gage. Thank you, Preston. Um, I'm so excited. First time, honestly, I'm a little bit nervous too, but I'm 
I'm so excited for this and I'm really grateful to you for, uh, you know, listening to what I had to say. I reached out to you actually after, um, we just had a national conference for the National High School Strength Coaches Association. And one thing that really kind of just gave me a little bit more sense of urgency is the amount of female participants a lot of times at the clinics. And um, a lot of you have been to clinics. Um, I'm not one that I've been to a lot of college clinics, but in the high school clinic, I'm really seeing still just about five to 10% females. So, and I know that there are great female coaches out there. And one thing that I really, really know from being in this industry is the support of male coaches. And there have been so many great male coaches who have helped me, who have supported me, who have reached out and I mean, and just respected what we're doing. So I don't think it's necessarily that why our numbers are so low. So just thinking about a little bit, I love the Big Time Strength Coach podcast. I know that you reach a big audience, that you reach a lot of males in your audience, a lot of females. And I thought this could be a great way to, in a positive way, highlight what some females are doing in the industry. And I, I think it'll be great just to see coaches, what they're doing, and maybe ones who may not say, hey, interview me, I'm ready to go. I wanna, I wanna tell you what I do. In general, as females, um, not saying for everybody, but probably myself included, it's a little bit harder to say what I do and try and tell somebody to, to listen to what I have to say. So I think it'll be great to highlight a f um, some great female coaches. Uh, even one thing too is, is talking, I had heard that female speakers, you know, a lot of times they can't even find female speakers and us as females are like, why aren't there female speakers? Well, they're, they're not uh, necessarily stepping up to the plate. So that's where I'm coming in. That's why I reached out to you. And um, just that sense of urgency. So if you, um, one thing before you go, if you listen to my podcast, I had talked about the book Lean In. And for males and females, I'd say there's a TED Talk that Sheryl Sandberg did. She uh, works with Facebook. And she had said why we do not have enough female leaders um, in the tech industry is what she talked about. But I think it really follows suit in the strength and conditioning. And some of the key highlights that she said is you got to step up to the table and tell them your ideas and you have to support other females in the industry. So I'm hoping my mission through this podcast is I'm able to do that. So excited to be on. Coach, we're excited to have you. And, and one of the things that was exciting when you reached out, you talked about you already have people that you, you have lined up, you want to have. You told me at the time you had six. You probably have more than that now. But I, this is kind of an all call. If you would like to reach out to Coach Berg, just send an email to bigtimestrength at gmail.com, um, and she'll respond to you there, or one of us will get you hooked up with her. Um, just, just trying to open the door for coaches that are making the big time where they're at. doesn't matter if you're male, female, what part of the state or uh, the uh, nation you're in. Uh, I just think it's, it's super important for everybody that is putting so much time and effort into their athletes to be able to talk about what they're doing and learn from other people. So I think it's vital for our professional development. I'm excited to have Amanda on. Thank you, coach. Yes. Yes. Females, this is your call. Reach out. Okay. Talk to us about what you've got going on and let's get you on here. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's all that's really awesome. And I, I just think about, I don't know, when I interned at Mizzou, there was two females there, um, Coach Jana Heidmeyer and Kaylin Stitcher. And they were just the two of the most impressive coaches I have ever seen. Not like I've seen a billion of them, but you know, in my young career so far still, but man, they're just so impressive. And I think given a platform for coaches like that to really speak out um, on whatever they need to and support the industry, I think is huge. And we are so excited to be a part of that. Um, and if you want to hear more of Coach Berg, she mentioned it and I already have as well, go back and listen to um, number 73, the Big Time Strength Podcast. Uh, she does a great episode there. You can get more of her background on who she, who she is, but you'll, you'll get to know her really well here moving forward. So. 
Um, with that, we kind of have a round table uh, to finish this thing out. We got each one of us going to kind of present a, a question to the table and then let's kind of all give our thoughts on it. So I'll kick it off. And side note on this, for anybody who's uh, a long time listener and has any like specific questions you would like for us to uh, maybe add into our um, bank that we kind of pull out of, and maybe some of these questions that we talk about here in just a second will be added to that. But if you have any other topics, please let us know. Uh, we, we'd like to get a little bit more involved with our listeners. Uh, we're going to do a better job on social media. We talked about that. Um, so hang in there with us on that. Um, but our first question to start with on this round table is, is mine. And I, mine is, what is something that maybe earlier in your career about strength conditioning that you really thought was true, or this is definitely how it has to be that for whatever reason, you don't necessarily believe anymore, or you've questioned, or you think differently of now. Um, and with that, I'll let Preston take the first stab at this. <laughs> um, so there's a couple of ways I thought about this question prior to, and one of them was just like training philosophy. And I know that's always a big term when we say training philosophy that encompasses so much, but more so kind of the X's and O's of actual strength and conditioning. And then the other way I thought about it was just coaching style or um, relationship building or that type of stuff. So I'm going to start out with the X's and O's and maybe we'll come back to the, uh, to the connection or the relationship building stuff. But one of the things that I thought always had to be done was you had, you had to squat, you had to do Olympic lifts. Okay. And that was just my background. Um, we always, uh, in high school, there was a certain way that we did things. Um, we kind of had the same framework and we did it all the way from when we were a freshman to a senior and kind of rotate through, you kind of knew what was always happening and what was next. And, and that was just what we did. And that's all I knew at that time. And then I went to Northwest Missouri State and my eyes were opened up a little bit that there are other ways to train, but still it, re it was solely reliant on bench squat clean. That was the only way to do things. And and at that point, like there wasn't even an addition to deadlift within our program. Now I think um, Coach Quinlan at Northwest Missouri State does a lot more trap bar deadlifting now um, and maybe a little bit of straight bar, but there's only one summer that we did straight bar deadlifted when I was in college. And, and so for, for us um, coming in as athletes, you know, we go from all these different backgrounds, and, but it was still like these were the foundational things. And more and more that I go down these rabbit holes and I'm, I learn from other coaches and I'm seeing what works. And, and the idea that you don't have to fit everybody into the things, like not everybody is made the same. Not everybody needs to do everything similar. Maybe the first example I'll give is, is like Olympic lifting. I don't, I don't think Olympic lifting is the end all be all, but I also think it's a great tool, you know? So if you want to use it, go for it. One of the things I think about though is like, we have a six, eight guy um, center on our basketball team that, you know, like pulling from the floor was not something that I was going to put him in a position to do. So like um, when you really look at clean, let's say in general, uh, we don't pull from the floor ever. Uh, we always go from a hang. And that was something that I learned while I was at Northwest Missouri State was like, why would we pull somebody that's five foot six and somebody that's six foot eight from the same spot? You know, the, the bumpers or the plates are always the same size. But that's not exactly what we want to be doing with our athletes, right? It's not going to put them in the same position. So instead, going from the hang puts them both in an athletic position and being explosive to move. Now, you know, like there's tons of rabbit holes off of that, that topic alone, but it's, it's something that stood out to me. And then now you guys see a lot of the bilateral, unilateral training. And now um, even more, I'm looking into what's it look like to make bench press a main upper body lift, I think it has to be one of those. But I was always, uh, always told that bench press was the big upper body lift without ever thinking about the backside. And if you really want to know how to be healthy and how to be a strong, how to be a strong athlete, I think you have to have some sort of maximal effort upper body pull, uh, whatever that is for your program. We use a weighted pull up, and we use um, it's kind of like a board row where we lay a two by ten across the safeties and and pull through the board where there's a definite start and there's a definite end to the lift. And our kids love both of those. And they can see as, as they build their backup, it actually helps out with their bench press too. So did we ever, um, did we ever throw that training out the window? No, but when you make something a big emphasis in a program, 
kids start to gravitate towards that. And that's something that I, that I made that switch. And um, so maybe my overarching theme for all of this is I think you always have to evaluate what's been done. Does it work? Why are we doing it? How are we going to move forward? And, and I like Gage's question because of that. So Gage, you can uh, direct it to Amanda now, I think, right? Yeah, I love it, Preston. Go for it, Amanda. Yeah, I, I think speaking along those lines, as far as posterior chain, that was one of the big one I really missed out on at the beginning of my career as well. So, uh, and has become so important. And so I'd also say a big one where my philosophy has completely changed is just the sheer concept of volume a little bit. I'd say when earlier, in my career, I really thought that you had to make them tired. You know, I obviously knew a volleyball player shouldn't be running a mile in order to condition, but I was still, especially for high schoolers, I was conditioning too, too much, you know, maybe running bleachers and going into 30 second to a minute type of activities. And along the weight room line, I remember at the beginning of a career, I had, you know, these huge complexes at the end, like a shoulder complex or a lunge complex where we're doing four different exercises of 10 on each, you know, and so they're getting 50, 60 reps at the end of their workout when they're already tired. So I think I really made, have really changed as far as that is that we do not need to make them tired, especially the high schoolers in order to make them better at their sports. And what really got to me where it finally hit that aha moment was when I was listening to Mike Boyle, he was at, you know, a conference and he talked about buckets and he talked about what kind of buckets do you need to fill for these athletes? You know, so he talked about the conditioning bucket and the, um, the strength bucket and the power bucket and in the conditioning bucket, they're getting it right. They're getting that in practice. That's where they get that. So they don't necessarily, I don't need to take um, our time to do it. And, you know, speaking with the sponsor, uh, we've started Jeremy Evans, uh, his stuff, and I can't say enough great things about it because now the philosophy for me is everything that sh they sh should be able to do it, but they can do it in game speed mode. You know, that's how I'm really doing our programming now. And as far as testing, we're starting to go shorten that, turn it into a sprint distance, you know, maybe a 10 yard sprint. So Definitely my biggest mistake that I've done a 180 is volume, sheer volume. So as you guys are talking, you know, I think, I just think about all the things that I thought just come from Northwest and you have so much success there. And Joe does such a great job that it took me a while to get out of that mindset that just because he did it that way within his system with his athletes and his facility, I need to try to make that happen here um, and not ever really getting to the bottom of, okay, why did he do that? And there's some things I still do and they work fantastic, but there's some things that Joe would do when I was a GA there that worked really well for his setup there that as I found out, didn't necessarily work out very well for mine and it could be for a million reasons. Um, so this question is really hard for me to answer. So I'm going to try to maybe give just like an overarching theme and I think what I've really tried to hone in on lately is simple works. And early on, I tried to, I'm just thinking from an exercise selection standpoint, you could probably take this overarching theme into other things, but you know, like from cycle to cycle, I tried to change every exercise because I didn't want the athletes to get bored and like do all these things. And what, I was about a year and a half in. I told my GA at the time, Miles Clifton, who's been on the podcast a few times. I was like, man, I feel like we are okay at about a million things and we're not really good at anything. So what we decided to do is like, okay, let's just crunch all this down into our main stuff. And let's just focus on getting really good at that, adding variation where we needed to. And our training, our results, and just our proficiency just got... 10 times better just by focusing on those main rocks and getting really good at those and not worrying about these million different variations that their athletes don't need. And I think that's the one that I just always go back to is just, it was really eye opening to me. It's like, man, this is so simple, but it works so well. 
But what challenge with that was, is I trained my athletes for a year and a half to get them to buy into going back to, we're going to take three steps back here and get really simple. Uh, Focus on just having great intent on these things. And it took a while to get some athletes to kind of buy into that. Um, Going back to Amanda too, is um, not having a finisher at the end of every workout where it's like, all right, great work. Now we have a finisher. We're just going to blow you up now. And getting away from that too is something I've done. And we do that at times. I think there's time and place for it. Um, But then getting our athletes to understand my change of philosophy or mindset I too has been a challenge at times because, you know, like, why don't we do these finishers anymore or whatever? It's like, well, this, this, and this, and more isn't always better. And let's try to do this, you know, having those conversations with them isn't necessarily what they want to hear. So I guess trying not to get on too much of a tangent here, but that has been a challenge a little bit within my, uh, I guess, evolution as a coach, as you've been in a place for a while, those athletes are going through that evolution too. So communicating with them, what you're thinking um, and why they should buy into it has been a challenge, but once it, you get through that um, and they see the results, it speaks for itself. So um, I had another one, but I've, we're on the stage and I forget what it was now. I'm sure I'll, I'll think of it in a second. Um, but I guess just my overarching thing is like keeping things simple works so much better than trying to um, get fancy and complicated. It's just and complex, I guess is a better word. It's just not, it's not worth it. We've gotten better things by being simple. It doesn't mean it's easy, but being simple works. So that's my answer to my own question. Let's kick it over. Preston, what do you got? Well, just to finish up with what Gage was saying there, that last little point, um, Craig Edwards, uh, I think he's like at New Hampshire or something. Um, I saw his stuff on Twitter a decent amount. I, I kind of gravitate towards kind of his training style. And one of the things that he just tweeted here recently was, I see all this stuff going on in gyms, all these fancy things, and we're just here doing the basics over and over and over. And I'm like, sense right simplicity works why change it i i like that um i think it's it's finding the balance to to keep everybody engaged um but staying simple so i think tempos and and just different changes within like i've been doing a ton of research and try basic training again I'm like you know this this changes a lift in itself and you're still doing the same lift you know like so awesome benefits there amanda's up in minnesota so she's like yes yeah try basic <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> love triphasic in Minnesota. <laughs> but um, I think uh, I think that's great stuff. I, I like these these questions because it's writing down my notes. I'm thinking, okay, I got to check my volume. Got to check. <laughs> it's simple. So um, my question for you all is: What outcomes do you want your athletes to walk away with from your program? And you measure and track those. And this is kind of going off of, if you guys listen to the podcast with Gage, where he goes through the different things that he tracks with his athletes, I started to go down this path. I'm like, man, you know what? If my outcomes, if my standards are to build a championship culture and then everything that goes with that, then, you know, everybody says that what, what you measure matters. If I'm not measuring it, then does it really matter to us? You know, if I say build the championship culture, and then I don't do anything to back that up other than just jab at them all the time and talk to them all the time. And, you know, like it, at some point, you know, we have to see where the rubber meets the road and then also track it along the way. So my question to you guys is what are you guys doing to track that? What are the, the things that you want your athletes to walk away your program with? Um, let's see. I'll take, I'll take this one here. Uh, I think as far as individual athletes and students, you know, if we're at a high school and I'm a teacher as well, and I'm thinking about it, like, oh, how am I tracking it? But the ultimate goal or my mission is that every single student who's walked through the weight room can leave our school, Dasco Cocado, and walk into any facility, any weight room as an athlete into a health club, and they can own it. You know, they can put a workout together. They can walk into a facility. They can look at different equipment and say, okay, I can do this, 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 and this is going to be a great workout. And this is going to improve whatever goal that I have. So uh, we have a 
theme as far as our mission and it's um, charge up, charge in, charge through, and then charge on. And it really stems from uh, Gary Schofield, who um, a high school strength and conditioning coach and where he says, you know, move well. So I'm thinking as far as we're doing a lot of rubrics and having the students check themselves as far as form. Uh, we say move strong next you know so that would be kind of adding the weight then we say move fast and then finish it up move for life and that kind of goes into that whole doing no harm to them that when they leave high school they are healthy for life we did not hurt them we did not wear out their bodies while they were in high school so that would be my ultimate measure i think is if they leave and i know that our strength and conditioning program only made them better for the rest of their life Honey, that's great, Coach. And I guess when I answer this question, I think about the objectives we've set for a department, you know, and it's obviously we, we can easily track, like Press is not really talking about KPIs as we want them to get stronger and all that, obviously. Um, but kind of our mission, I guess, and vision is just to teach them how and to instill in them the mindset of just getting better of just pursuing getting better, being the best version of themselves. And it's, it's very cliche now. Maybe it always has been. Um, but we are so, I don't know, I just getting into that mindset that you can always do stuff better and there's always something to get better at. And honestly, when we started training again in June, I was kind of disappointed a little bit. Just full transparency as I got, you know, because we – we spent last eight, nine weeks just sitting home at home workouts, right? Mm -hmm. So we come back in and the first day was give them kind of a circuit thing just to get through. I just want to see how they're moving. And some of our guys that had been in our program for two or three years just forgot how to do the step up or was just didn't realize that they needed to stand all the way up or they were just half assing it. I don't know. But it was kind of bummed me out. And I, you know, I've been reflecting a little bit. It's like, well, if they're, what, what has their training looked like over the last eight weeks on their own? And what does that reflect on our program? And of course, you'll never know because you, I mean, you're not there with them uh, training. So I thought, man, I don't, there's something that we need to revisit or something, or maybe it was just a bad day. But, and it was just two of our 20 athletes. The other 18 looked great, but there's like two of them like, man, I know that that is not how I've taught you how to do that. And I've seen you do it a lot better than that before. So why are you doing that like that now? Is it just because you're not within our walls? Is everything gone? And I know it's probably a bleeding goal to get 100% everybody's dialed in when they leave my program. But I hope, like coach, that when they leave here from a health standpoint, that they know how to train. They know how to do it safely. They know the importance of it. Um, and they look good doing it. And people, when they, when they look at them, they could say, man, that, that guy knows how to train. But from like a personality standpoint, I, I hope they have that mentality of something we talk about is just like, um, it, it doesn't matter, get better. It's the focus three stuff that we talk about a lot. And it's like eliminating excuses and um, this just victim mindset and just getting better no matter what it is. And if you didn't get the job you wanted or, um, you know, your marriage isn't going the way you wanted or your kids are acting up, the, the problem is you, number one, taking ownership of it. And that the only thing you could do from that is just improve on it and get better. And I'm hoping that we instill that mindset through them because we talk about that, I feel like, all the time. Um, but maybe we need to talk about it more. <laughs> Uh, so I guess, I guess that's kind of the overarching theme, I guess, is just, and it goes back to our mission as a department, as we talk about, we want to be known as being a premier department and pushing our athletes towards the best version of themselves. Um, so do I track that? You get, like Preston mentioned, if you go back to our, an episode, a few episodes ago, um, for the big time strength clinic we did, I kind of dive into how we, we track our culture and things. And I got that from Silvernagel um, at St. Mary, or is it Mount St. Mary? Um, or Mary Strength. And he does a fantastic job. So 
we do those things, but that's one that I don't know. You just kind of, it's, you just kind of got to look at them after they are out of your program for a few years and like, are they doing all right? And obviously I'm not taking credit for everything they do. Um, but it is always good when you get a, a text from a former athlete and they say, um, they're still training or they check in with you, you know, they did, you made some impact on them. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Maybe we should start getting paid by focus three as much as we talk about it, but <laughs> man, the focus three podcast, um, part of the reason why I, I dive into this stuff so much plus Gage talks about it a decent amount. And then, uh, one of our buddies, uh, Jake Niederman, who's at the University of Minnesota, um, he's huge in just to daily disciplines and what it looks like to, to be the best version of yourself. And his big thing is to care. Like, no matter what or where or who you're around, you need to care about those people because they're people, you know? I just love hearing his perspective on that type of stuff. And it's just all of my backgrounds are forming together into these thoughts and these focus three podcasts and, and the stuff that they put out on Twitter and their daily discipline email and all these different things starting to come together. I'm like, man, why didn't I know all of this stuff in a well packaged deal prior to this? And the reason why I asked this question is because I'm trying to like put together a curriculum, right? And I know strength coaches, PE teachers, and, you know, teachers in general have been putting this stuff together for a long time, but I wanted to package it up so well that our athletes could use it for life, right? They could think it through each one of those things and be like, you know what? This is part of E plus R equals O or doesn't matter, get better, or no BCD or all these little like little analogies or little terms or little short sentences. They know what it means and they know how to apply it. So I'm sitting in the same, go to, uh, same boat as Gage, but I just, I'm trying to really hone in. How do I track it? What does that look like? So. If you're a listener and you're like, man, I know how to do this stuff or um, Coach Rozier, I think, they, is it is his last name um, pronounced Nine? Coach yeah. Nine at Salisbury, like he's got some amazing stuff out there. I love going through his commitment stuff. Um, I think he takes Jeff Janison's stuff and kind of puts it together with the team aspect. And man, I think those things are great. And I, I just want to continue to learn more about that. So if you around that path and you're trying to look at it, then um, I, I really think that it's, it's pretty cool that, um, you know, Coach Berg is going to charge up or uh, charge on in, in life. And, and then Coach Rozier is going to make sure that they're, you know, they're pursuing excellence through their whole life. That's, that's really what I'm searching for. So thanks for that. Not sure if I'm going to answer my own question though. So. <laughs> I love it. I saw a great presentation on his and how he puts teams into percentages, you know, and it, you can seem like you're doing everything right, but when you add it all together, you're at 70%. And would you accept 70%? You know, do you want to be a team of 70% or do you want to be up 95%? So great stuff from his end. Yeah. Uh, well, my, my question kind of stems from that, actually, where I heard of Coach Nine is in the high school world, we've been doing these uh, coach coaching nexuses through through play and uh, coach Gary Schofield and Jeremy Boone have been leading them and Jeremy Boone's big thing is that connection trumps communication and how are we connecting with these athletes and how are they experiencing you and just turning it around a little bit on yourself and how how is this athlete experiencing me right now so my question to you guys doesn't really have to do with programming, but it's a little bit about um, caring. So kind of along the lines, number one, how do athletes experience that you care about them? And two, kind of what strategies are you using? You know, what are you mentally taking stock of? Okay, I need to make sure I'm doing this, this, and this to give it a better connection with my athletes. Um, so I'll start on this one. And I think... I don't know, as I'm giving these answers, I'm trying not to think about just like answers I've heard a lot of coaches say before. Um, you know, so I think like the easy ones that people will naturally gravitate to is like talk to them about, you know, stuff outside the sport and ask them how they're doing and, and all those things, which are huge and certainly try to do those for sure. 
Um, but I'll tell you, it's challenging because there's one thing we try to do is I try, I do try to engage every athlete that comes in, um, in some way, whether it's just a high five, because there's how we have to run our weight room. There's, there's four teams and well, maybe not in the COVID era, era now, but there used to be four teams and 90 athletes in the building at one time. And maybe I can't connect with them, but you at least try to acknowledge all of them when they're in their, your facility in some way might not be very deep, but in some way. Um, but then obviously we try to get to their games um, as much as we can and stuff like that. But that's a challenge sometimes. It really is. Cause like I got two kids now and I'm at the office so much and then to go home and then get my wife and the kids all loaded up and come back. It's a challenge sometimes. And I, maybe I don't, maybe that's an excuse because I'm, I should probably make more games than I do. I mean, I, I make it to at least one or two of each team's games per year. I don't blow them off by any means, but I tell you that was a challenge for me. And that's hundred percent transparency is um, I struggle with that one a little bit of getting to every team's games all the time. And some coaches make you feel guilty that if you're not there on the sideline <laughs> cheering for them every time that you don't care. It's like, man, that's just not, I don't think that's right. I don't think that's practical. Uh, at least, at least not for me in my situation. So I guess one thing that I try to do that shows them I care about them and maybe it's indirectly is I'm always trying to make our department better in a way that they can feel it uh, based off like their feedback on what they want. So again, if you go back to my podcast a few episodes ago, I'll talk a lot about some stuff we've implemented and all that was done to improve their experience and to give them a better, to allow me to give them a better training um, experience or program or whatever you want to call it. Um, but we're always trying to do new things and keep things fresh and implement new things to help them in some way. And I hear from them that they really appreciate that and that it's, we're always trying to do something different. So I guess, I don't know if that answers your question very well, but I feel like we, we do all the things that everybody always talks about. And that's, you know, we, we talk to them, we ask them about how their life is and all that. Um, but I wanted to try to think outside the box of this question a little bit. And I think we do it the most um, by just always improving our department. And it goes back into the mission itself is not only do we want them to be the best version of themselves, we want to be the best version of ourselves as coaches. And the same thing is how they experience me. I feel like I am extremely consistent. Like I'm always like just right here. I'm never like super high banging my head against the wall cause it's squat max day. I'll, mm -hmm. And I'm never like super low at all either really. I'm always kind of in the middle. So I think they know what to expect out of me. Um, oh, this is the other thing I wanted to say is that the other thing I think is just being prepared. I think they know how much we care about them. Um, by little things like our room is perfect. Yeah. The stuff is set up right. When they come in, they don't have to touch a weight. The room is set up for them. Every once in a while, maybe they have to adjust stuff or something because the flow got out of hand and my staff was too busy or whatever. But everything is set up. They just have to walk in and train. And I think indirectly that shows that we give a crap about them. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I think I, I answered enough on that question. But um, I don't know if exactly what you're looking for, but I wanted to try to think outside the box a little bit on it. Gage, do you feel yourself doing any uh, maybe inventory of them? Like how, what strategies do you use maybe if you find out something about them or are you keeping yeah. track of maybe something they like or activities? Um, yeah, so to an extent, um, we've done a personal inventory. I think Ron McKeefery, uh talks about this that we've done, I, I just can't get, I haven't been able to get to all athletes on it. But last year with our incoming freshman class with football, I had the time during the summer where we sat down with them and talked to them. We asked them like six questions, just get to know them. You know, it's, and they're deep questions. They're like, you know, what's the hardest thing you've had to go through? And who's your, who do you look up to? Who's your mentor? Um, what do you want to, you know, what's your career aspirations and stuff like that. And you really get to know some of these kids in that way. And that was super helpful. Uh, we had a kid who's transferred and it, we had a really strong connection um, because of that meeting, I think. 
And he talked about after he transferred, he reached out to me and said he had a shoulder surgery and he went and had it over winter break. And he said, I was the only, and maybe this is more of a, maybe a slap on our staff face more than a credit to me, but it said that I was the only coach that reached out to him during that time to see how he was doing. And that meant a lot to him that I did that. And I thought, man, why aren't, it's a really simple thing to do. And it's, and I knew, I had a connection with that kid because I don't know, we explored these kind of deep conversations with him. And I wish I had the time to do that more uh, with all of our athletes, but I just, I just don't, honestly, I just don't have the time. Uh, but it's kind of the day-to-day -day stuff. If I, if I have, I always carry on a notepad with me. If I say, Hey, Johnny, how you doing today? And he says something about, you know, my mom's just found out my mom has cancer or something. I'll, I'll make a note of that um, in my notes and stuff. And I always got to relook back at that week to week. Uh, but I don't have like a set structure where I have like a running list of what's going on in people's lives. Good idea though. What do you think, Preston? Uh, I got the wheels turning after Gage. Gage said it because I didn't want to be uh, the, the cliche different things, you know, like the uh, um, get to know them, talk to them each session, you know, but here's, here's three usable things that I do every single day when I have student teachers come in and they learn. These are like some of the things that we talk about with student teachers and any interns that I have. We talk for like uh, probably over a month of life. of just personal about before we ever talk about coaching X's and O's because I believe it's so important and I think it's completely undercoached. And if we are going to build culture, I think that has to be the thing that we do. So, um, you know, from my perspective, these are the three things that I want to do every single day. I'll tell our interns, I'll tell our student teachers, and they do these same things. And it's really cool to see and watch it happen is say every single athlete's name. So every athlete that you have come through the door, you say their name. Um, when, when, I, when you say someone's name, there's already a connection made. So if I would say, Amanda, it you gets your attention, attention, you know that I know you and you know that I'm looking at you, right? I don't see Amanda without having some intentionality to it. So I could talk to you or I could say your name and then talk to you. So it's just that extra little bit there. And one of my main here within our walls, say people's name, say it, um, because you, you have more of a connection there. The second thing is a physical connection. So I say the name and then physical connection sounds kind of funny, but it's, it's most of the time hand slaps um, or, uh, or if you do fist bumps or some sort of something that's gonna get people to know that you're, you see them and, and you're connected with them. And you know, like right, right before spring break when we heard this COVID stuff was going out, we'd go through and we'd high five with our feet instead of our, or you know, everybody's doing the elbow high five type thing, whatever it is but there's going to be some sort of connection. And, and people, for whatever reason, every time that happens, um, they smile too, right? So like, I know that there's some sort of positive thing happening. And I don't know if you guys are fans of John Gordon at all, but uh, John Gordon talks about emotion is energy in motion. And when you see somebody smile, others can feel it. And that's a good thing. And we get the energy moving in the right direction. And then coach every athlete every day. What that means is I can't just coach one rack. I can't just coach one guy. I can't coach only something that's bad. I coach every person every single day. Um, and once again, if you're using names, if you give them physical contact, you know, like great, great set. These are the things I saw, high five, you know, like that type of stuff. But those three things are the things that I come back to over and over and over again. But I love how Athletes know you care when you give them a big time experience. And I love to name drop our podcast right here. But when you give an athlete a big time experience, they know you care. And when you drop the ball and you apologize for it and you take ownership for it, very similar to like the extreme ownership type mindset, they know that you care. Because we're going to fall short. They fall short. Everybody falls short. But when you own it, they know that you care. It's like the, that's the number one thing I see from extreme ownership. And the book, I, I loved it so much because it was just one more way for my athletes, for my coworkers, for whoever it is to know that I really care about what's happening and I want it to be the best that it can for them so that they can have the greatest experience that they can.
So those are the things that I think about. And then you threw in the personal inventory. So I, I'm just going to throw this out there. If you're a coach listening to this, shoot us an email, big time strength. Um, at gmail.com, if you want the personal inventory that I use, I love, I'm going to still gauge his six questions. I'm going to ask for his. But I have one where it used to be like a three page packet and I'd have them fill it out. And it was taking me forever to read through all my athletes. I couldn't do it anymore. So I did a front back one. I really like the questions that we have. Front side is the questions kind of like Gage is talking about, like the six that he was talking about. And the back side is a scale. So it's one to five. Um, how respectful are you? How, how much courage do you have? You know, all these different things and they rate themselves. And it was, I store those for their four years. And then when they graduate, I hand all those back out and they can see the growth that they had over the course of their high school career. And I like being able to see their growth also. So um, that's one of the things. And I stole that from Ross Suizo at base of Linwood high school. Um, he's an athletic director there now, but I'm sure he, he has a ton of stuff along this line of stuff too. Wow. Yeah, I like that. I mean, how, what an impact that's going to make on them, you know, given getting that back. And I, I, I like your three things because that's a great way for you to check yourself as a coach every day, right? You got three goals and you can reflect on it each day and say, did I do that today? So. Yeah, that's, but that's nice for me because I'm a, I'm, <laughs> I, I need some sort of accountability for that to happen, right? Like I just don't just do it. I had to have some sort of checklist. So and it sounds shallow in that way but I, it's because I care. I want that to happen. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, on my end, as far as um, athletes experiencing they care, I th think this is something I've really had to work on a lot. I always thought it was just enough to be tough and to know what I'm doing and to have high expectations. And I'm really realizing now that a lot of times athletes will take that as more of a threat than a challenge. So the just asking myself, how are these athletes experiencing me right now has really made me check myself a lot better. And I try and do that. I actually try to do that with my kids even more. You know, sometimes I'm harder on my kids than I am my athletes. But, um, and then I really learned two concepts that just makes me let things go and just really enjoy kids. And that's meet them where they're at in their life and no judgment. You know, I think in where they're at, maybe if they are late, if they are lazy, if they're not showing up to workouts. In the past, I would have thought, well, that, you know, there's just no helping that athlete. And now I really realize it's my goal to have the conversations of why are you late? Um, do you think that your teammates should have to tolerate that you're late? Should we as coaches have to tolerate? And turning it into questions for them and turning it into more of an experience for them. So that's been a big one. And then just going along with that lines of non-judgment, just because an 18 year old boy is an 18 year old boy today does not mean he's going to be that way 10 years from now. And I want them 10 years from now to have the experience with me of like, I really cared about them and I believed in them no matter what, because they're not going to remember that maybe they were disrespectful or they didn't believe in what I was telling them at that time. So but they are going to remember the experience I gave them. So that's been a big one just to help me really think, how are they experiencing me right now? Um, and then strategies that I use is, I use the three question strategy now. So in my mind, I cannot give them anything related to strength and conditioning until I've kind of asked them three questions, maybe about what they did in the weekend, what uh, if they've talked to somebody, how things are going, so for instance, you know, if I see I'm walking by and somebody's doing the deadlift incorrectly, I would, in the past, I probably would have said, um, hey, you need to do this, this, and this. And now I'm like, have I asked them those three questions? And if I haven't, I don't even address the weightlifting part yet. So that has been um, a big one on that. And then two, what I started with COVID is actually just calling kids. And I cannot believe the experiences that I've had. I thought it was going to be weird. Um, we just happened to have like uh, days where Tuesday and Thursday, we didn't have to do schoolwork. And so I took those days where I just called the kids and some amazing conversations really happened. Um, kind of focused on the leaders first and then kind of started going down to the younger ones. So that's something that I'm going to keep going and doing. We have a leadership academy at our school so I'll keep doing that but 
That's awesome. I think uh, there's a couple of things that stood out to me. Um, when you say meet them where they're at, uh, I used to think if you didn't hit the standard, that you could kind of like go back to Gage's question at the very beginning, like what did you used to think and then what, what do you think now? I used to think that it was okay for coaches to write somebody off. Um, mm -hmm. That was just the experience that I had had, uh, not as much in high school, as much as it was in college, where I saw somebody wasn't performing. I saw coaches literally write people off and they never talked to them again. And I was just like, man, that's messed up, you know? And so I really started, to, and my strength coach was never like that. He, he says he gets mad at himself. So this is Joe Quinlan, he gets mad at himself when he ever has a thought of writing a kid off or, or whatever it is. Like he, he like calls himself out on that because um, you know, like you hear like drill killers or whatever, whatever the, the terminology is, that is your opportunity to coach. That's why you're there. Like that is your job. That's your impact. Like what better opportunity to show that you can coach someone than to have somebody that's really hard to coach. Right. Like, mm -hmm. so I think, I think that's really cool to when you say meet them where they're at because everybody needs to be coached and not everybody's going to hit the same standard where you're at. It's the idea that the standard is always moving for every individual and it's always like Gage talks about pursuing excellence. If we're not getting better continually. So um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put that one down in my notes to keep, keep coming to meet, meet them where they're at. And then last thing, I, I ask silly questions every day. Um, like today at Strength and Speed, we asked um, Crest or Colgate, uh, and I said, if you don't know what those are, then you probably need to go do some research or go to a dentist, one of the two. Um, and, but what happens over time is they get used to me asking questions over and over and over. Hot dogs or hamburgers, Crest or Colgate, pancakes or waffles, you know, all of these things. And then when I ask them, you know, what's going on with you? They, sit, they tell me because they're comfortable talking with me. And I ask them a question every single day. So I love what you, you, you talk to them, right? You get to know their person before you coach them. Um, I think it's super important. If you ask them silly questions, I think it opens up for you to ask real questions that matter. Yeah, every one of those questions like that are just building the relationship, you know, for when you may have to have a hard conversation with them. So love it. Crestor Colgate, I'm using it. All right, guys, this is... Uh... Hopefully you know what those are, right, Coach? <laughs> no kidding. Um, I would... I agree 100% with you, Preston. I was actually going to make a similar point. I think it's so easy to, uh, you know, because I'm in, in college, you get, you know, these 40, 18-year-olds coming into the football program and obviously all the other sports, and there's going to be a handful of those guys that can't seem to show up on time or they're, they just do stuff that they're not supposed to be doing. So it's just so easy just to write those kids off and like, oh, he doesn't get it. But, like, at some point, it just hit me. It's like, well, he's an 18 year old kid. Like, he's not, <laughs> he's not supposed to get it all right now. Um, I wish like his strength coach would have, like Preston would have done better with him, but I can't control that. Good joke, Preston. Um, <laughs> so, like you said, it's, it's your opportunity to coach. So, if, it's, if you're there to change lives, like everybody says, and you write off the kids that just show up late all the time. You don't really get to know those kids and figure out why that is and try to help them with that or whatever it is that you think is important you to help them with. Then you're not doing your job as a coach. You're that's there as a cheerleader to cheer on the ones who do get it in your eyes. So I think yeah. it's a great point. I think it's an awesome point both of you made there. And um, I do want to wrap this up with just, let's just do one like round quick question. And I'm looking at my bookshelf to make sure I have an answer. What is a, uh, a book or something that you kind of dived into during this COVID period or just recently? Amanda, you can go first. A uh, book that I'm diving into would be uh, Can't Hurt Me by David Goggins. And you got that one up there? Yeah, I do, actually. It's good. I like it. And uh, if you follow David Goggins on uh, social media, he has a very, I'd say, colorful military academy. Mm -hmm. or an academy uh, vocabulary. Um, and one thing I do want to say is he has a clean version of his book. So I got that one to put up in the weight room and, <laughs> and have up. So I nice. can relate to his, his colorful vocabulary a lot, but just great. The concept of you're probably only using about 40% of what you got. What if you try more? 
Yeah. So I really dove into that and it's been fun to follow him on social media after, after reading that. Yeah, that's great. What do you got, P? I'm trying to look the one. So COVID has been good and I'm a cheater. I use the audible a lot. Um, so I don't read as much as I should. I read a lot of articles, but I don't read books as well. Um, I guess I should have learned more or something in school, but so some of them that stand out to me, Ego is the Enemy and The Obstacle is the Way um, by Ryan Holiday. And I'm, I'm looking forward to, he's got another book out. I can't remember what it is. Um, something is the key. Uh, I'm going to uh, check that one out soon. Um, yeah, stillness is the key, right? Stillness is the key, I think. I, I'm going to take your word for it. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I love that. Um, that was another thing that I just like, I wish I would have known prior to being 27 years old. Right. Like I just, this had been taught to me at some point. Um, and so kind of the, the idea of stoicism is new to me. So that's been good. And I tie that up with like anything with Jocko. Um, so I finished the leadership strategies and tactics earlier this year. And like that just ties so well with so much of the obstacles of the way and he goes the enemy and, and all of that. And then I read raise your game um, by Alan Steen or maybe it's Stein, uh, but man, that was really good. And that got me rolling on how to group things for curriculum. So if you're going into curriculum for your student athletes, like what I was talking about with character development and that type of stuff, you could literally use his book and go chapter by chapter. He's got 15 chapters, three sections. Each section goes like person, team, and then like leadership of the team, like coach type, type deal. And man, just breaks it down really well. I thought that was great. And then... Um, in a pit with a lion on a snowy day that was recommended to me back in college um, from Jake Niederman and I finally got it finished and it's the idea that we're supposed to run towards our challenges in life I mean, we are meant to run toward toward our challenges um, and we're not meant to, to run away and it's about the story of a dude that this lion falls in the, into a hole and instead of being like okay I can walk away now the guy uh, takes a few steps back, gets a running start, and then jumps down in the hole and kills the lion. And th and this was this is the whole idea of our life is we should be chasing the lion. So that one really stood out to me too. So like I said, I'm not a reader though. I listen to all this stuff. <laughs> yeah, that sounded like a Jake title. I knew Jake recommended that one to you. That last one, that's good. Um, I guess mine to finish up would be um, Peak. At, I don't have it down here. I don't know the subtitle. Uh, man, it's really good. It's, it's more of the X's and O's a little bit from a strength conditioning standpoint, athletic performance, but it is really good. It's very readable. It's got a lot of research in it, but it's like practical, readable, interesting research. It's not like, I can't, I'm not a big research guy, but it, it's called peak. It's something about athletic performance. You'll find it if you search for it. Um, peak, peak performance. There you go. Uh, your game, avoid burnout and thrive with the new science of success. Yes, it's, man, it was good. I, I really enjoyed it. Yeah, check that one out. And then another one is Fortitude and it's by Dan Crenshaw and he's a United States Senator, uh, former Navy SEAL. And it can be a little political at times, which I won't get into at times, but it's a, on here. But it's, it's just about like the outrage culture we have and American society and how it's turning into that and how to just like battle against that. Um, and the big thing that came out of that book that I really love is like, don't offend people, but also try really hard to not be offended. And that's something I've been just trying to think about a lot lately, like a lot lately. And he has a lot of really good stuff in that book, you know, regardless of your political association, I think it's just a really good read. Um, so that was Fortitude by Dan Crenshaw. So there's a couple I've, I've been dove into. So sounds uh, kind of like uh, stoicism a little yeah. bit. He actually mentions quite a bit of those um, principles, I guess, within the book. It's, it's really good. Um, suggest people check it out. So, all right, guys, this is, uh, this has been a really good, I've, I've enjoyed this conversation and I hope our listeners have as well, but uh, just a quick recap. This is season three. We're getting this thing rolling again. Um, a lot more new episodes coming out and you can expect to hear uh, coach Amanda Berg every three weeks now highlighting our female strength coaches, which I think is, we're very, very excited about. It's going to be a huge thing for our podcast and hopefully for our field in general. So, um, Preston, Coach, do you guys have any uh, 
parting words before we wrap this up? Oh, I'm excited. I just don't <laughs> know what I'm else excited. to say. I'm so excited and I'm excited for the, the coaches that you're going to meet in the next few weeks. So some great, great, great coaches. Sounds good. All right, guys. Well, thanks for tuning in to uh, this episode of the Big Time String Podcast. Uh, many more to come. You can hear Coach Preston and Coach Berg coming up the next two weeks. So stay tuned. We will talk to you soon. Thanks, guys. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you.